Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our session today on country of origin food labels. It's a whole new world I have to say uh, for me, but for our visitors from the ACCC, Clive Johnson and Emma Robinson from North Africa. So any questions you have, we're beautifully referring to your course. Welcome to our uh, viewers on the webinar. Hopefully we're coming through loud and clear. Uh, we acknowledge the land that we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their relationships with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to living Ghana people today. We also pay our respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people who may be visiting from other areas of South Australia in the present day. Please be aware, my staff and I will take photos during today's event, which we use on our promotional material and social media. If you don't want to be photographed, please let myself or Brenton know and we'll respect your wishes. Uh, facilities are located down the foyer to uh, the left, the men's first and the women's a little bit further on. In the event of an emergency, please stay calm. Take instructions from Brenton and myself. Our exit point is straight out the door to the fire escape there, uh, 13 flights of stairs down to the ground, and then a little bit more of a walk to our meeting place in High Marsh Square. Um, one thing you will get if there's an emergency is exercise. Uh, so we, we look forward to, we don't look forward to actually providing you with that exercise, uh, but in the event it happens, uh, please bear with us. We haven't had any events to this point in time and I'm not anticipating tonight will be the first. If you do need to leave the building at any time, please advise myself or my staff and we'll take a note of it. Welcome to our speakers today, Kylie Johnson from the Consumer and Small Business Strategies branch with the ACCC and Emma Robinson also from the same branch. We do a lot of work with the ACCC on a whole range of issues affecting small business and in terms of competition and uh, we are very thankful of your presence today. I'd just like to run through um, a few issues. And I think down the back I should welcome the member the board, um, the Honourable Francis Bedford. Welcome, thanks for attending. That's our shop front downstairs. If you haven't been into it at 99 Gold Place, I would encourage you to do so because we've got a lot of information to assist small businesses on a whole range of subjects. And if we haven't got it, we'll find out uh, where it resides for you. Our key role is helping businesses through disputes, be it with another business, local government, or indeed state government. We can help you in that regard. I've also got a responsibility to provide information out to small business on issues that can help you, hence our information sessions, and hence tonight looking at this uh, particular topic. My role is created under the Small Business Commissioner Act, which gives me powers to seek information from parties when we're trying to resolve disputes. If a dispute arises in the farming sector, news agents, motor vehicle franchising, or indeed building and construction industry, I can activate powers under the Fair Trading Act relating to industry codes in those sectors. That gives me a much greater power of inquiry and indeed the ability to compel people to attend alternative dispute resolution, such as mediation. Um, ideally, we like to get people together voluntarily. Sometimes in the big business world, they don't want to come to the table, and uh, that's when we can activate the powers in that particular area. I'm also responsible for the Retail and Commercial Lease Act, so if you're a small business, you're in rental premises, generally you'll be covered by the Act uh, under a lease. Now, that Act is designed to provide you as a small business with a whole range of protections. In your bags, there should be a Retail and Commercial Leasing Guide, which will give you the do's and don'ts. Uh, of what you need to do as a tenant in terms of a Retail Commercial Lease Act. Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Act is an adjudication process uh, which the Parliament has put through and that's designed to provide a fast track of payments to subcontractors and suppliers in the building industry. Late payment of government debts, if you are doing work for the government, you are supplying to the government and the government isn't paying you on time, let me know and I will make inquiries through the relevant agencies and usually once I start making inquiries, 
uh, things start to happen positively for those payments. Um, I see the new government uh, and Treasurer uh, Lucas has today indicated that from June, um, he will be naming and shaming departments that don't achieve their 30 day payment targets. So the pressure is going to be right on the CEOs uh, to lift their game in that regard. Already, we're running at about 95, 96%, but that's not 100%. So some work to be done. Mobile food vendors, I've got some responsibilities under the Local Government Act to deal with disputes arising when mobile food vendors and bricks and mortar businesses, for example, um, may come to some disagreements over location. Each council in the state was required to prepare location rules and publish those rules on the 1st of March. And if there's any issue uh, arising out of that, then it can be referred to me uh, to follow quite a detailed resolution process. Ultimately, I can direct a council to change its location rules um, if so required. We hope it doesn't get to that point. We're trying to certainly resolve any disputes that come up at the early stage in a hopefully a very conciliatory way. Work health and safety, I've got a few responsibilities in reviewing codes for businesses under uh, the Work Health and Safety Act. Information that will help you in small business, business.sa.gov.au. That's the website where we've brought together the information from the Department of Industry Skills, our office and the industry advocate who works very hard to make sure small businesses get a fair crack at state government procurement. Small Business Friendly Council initiative. Uh, I'm pleased to say our 19th council signed up today. Um, that was Unley Council. And this is a program designed to bring local government closer to their small businesses in their area. Small businesses are the heart and soul of council areas. And we think it's really important that the councils reflect that in their procurement, in their payment, but particularly in their policy making, that they think about small businesses uh, when they are developing policies. Phone call away, email away, please like us on Facebook because we'll keep you up to date on everything that's happening. Okay, that's the warm up act, now to the main show and I'll invite Kylie Johnson and Emma Robinson from the ACCC to give you all the information on country of origin food label. Now I've brought my coffee in which I'll sit there and quietly sip and I'm trying to work out from the notes whether Roasting a green coffee bean to make coffee for drinking, and it says it was tran if it's substantially transformed. Substantially transformed. Yes, exactly. So when I read down this list, it shows the complexities of what we're dealing with, and hopefully we can make it simple tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Very much. A little bit squishy but we'll make it work. Um, I'd like to say thank you firstly for everyone coming along, everyone watching at home. Um, so like John explained, our purpose is really here to provide information about the new country of origin food labelling requirements. Uh, now before we start, um, I'd just like a quick show of hands um, about how everyone would rate their understanding of the new requirements. Is there anyone who would say that they have a good or a great understanding? Okay, two, two. That's not a bad, bad rate. Um, so, uh, who would say then that they have a fairly limited understanding of the standard? Okay, that's what we're here for. <laughs> okay, so firstly, um, I'd just like to start with some key dates, um, just so everyone knows where we're at. Um, so, firstly, the country of origin food labelling information standard um, commenced on the 1st of July 2016. Um, the existing requirements in the Food Standards Code um, will remain in place until the 30th of June 2018. Um, so from now until the 30th of June 2018, you can either continue to comply with the uh, food stand, um, with the food code, um, or you can adopt the new labelling requirements under the standard. Now what we're telling people is don't leave it too late. Um, you do not want to be the business who isn't ready with your labels 1st of July um, and you also don't want to be the business who's still using incorrect labels on the 1st of July. Um, now, I'll point out 1st of July, the labelling requirements under the standard are mandatory. 
now the start date is set in the standard um, and the ACCC cannot um, extend the transition period. So what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to cover a lot of ground that will hope, hopefully help everyone. Um, so we're going to be looking at the ACCC's role, um, we're going to cover what the labels look like, who has to comply, um, the difference between priority and non-priority foods, um, we'll cover the four basic origin claims, um, when you can make a mating claim. Uh, we'll also cover how to calculate the proportion of Australian content in your food, which is going to be a really important thing for businesses. And we will go through the consequences of non-compliance. Okay, so we'll start off with a bit about ourselves, because who doesn't love talking about ourselves? Um, so a lot of you would know the ACCC from our role in enforcing the Competition and Consumer Act and the Australian Consumer Law. Um, and these two laws work together to govern how businesses in Australia deal with customers, competitors and suppliers. Um, so we've got two main purposes in that. So the first one is making sure businesses compete with each other in a fair and open market. Um, and then the second one is, um, of course, making sure businesses treat their <coughs> customers and consumers fairly. Um, so we do, we do this by taking businesses to court um, and also issuing fines for breaches of the law. Um, but on the other hand, we also provide guidance to businesses, big and small, about how they can comply um, with the necessary laws. Um, it's probably worth noting that we don't set policy. Um, so we basically get given a law and then we enforce it as it's made, um, which means we're not always the best people for the why is this in the law questions. We can tell you what the law is, but we can't tell you why it's made in that way, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so prior to this new um, country of origin food labelling standard, um, our role in food was fairly limited. Um, we took action when businesses made false, misleading or deceptive claims, um, but we didn't take action in the area of origin claims. Um, that was governed by uh, the Food Standards Code, um, so it was Fazans who were responsible for that in the past. Um, so we've got responsibility for enforcing this new standard um, and that's shared between us and state and territory fair trading agencies. Um, so some things we can and can't do. Um, so we can provide information about rights and regulations. So that means we can answer questions and things like this, we can give guidance. Um, but we can't um, tell you exactly what label to approve or kind of tick off that you're using the right label unfortunately we can't give uh, legal advice. Um, so we can investigate alleged breaches, um, but we can't act on behalf of individual businesses. Um, and again, we can direct you to useful resources, whether they're ones that we've developed um, ourselves as the ACCC or to other agencies as might be appropriate. Um, we also can't tell you whether a breach has occurred because ultimately that's up to a court. Oh, this is me too. Okay, so under the old system, which I'm sure a lot of you are quite familiar with, um, there was kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to origin labelling. Um, so the same rules applied to all, fo all foods across the board. Um, now, this is a major change in the standard. Um, the requirements will now vary on two factors. So the first one is whether your food is a what's called a priority or a non-priority food. There's seven non-priority food categories. We're going to cover off on them a bit later. Um, the second um, thing that you'll need to have a think about is whether the food was grown, produced, made or packed in Australia or another country, because that will also have an impact on the label that you ultimately choose for your product. Um, so while the contents of the labels will vary, um, and they do vary significantly, um, the labels themselves can be divided into three main categories. Um, and the key thing for you to do, most important thing that you can, we can't stress it enough that you do ASAP, um, is work out which label type applies to your food product, because that's going to be your first step in deciding which label you're going to need to use. Okay, so the three basic formats. Uh, so the first one, uh, hopefully people are starting to see in stores. So it, we call it the three-part kangaroo label. Um, so it has the kangaroo in a triangle, it has a bar chart and it has a text statement all in a box. That is the first type of label. The second basic format is your two part bar chart only label. Um, so the key, um, so obviously the difference is the kangaroo, um, but it also has a bar chart and a text statement. 
Now, a key feature of both the three-part and the two-part label is obviously the requirement to disclose the percentage of Australian content in your food. Um, so that's sort of the key distinguishing factor between the third category, which is the <coughs> statement. Um, now, I'd just like to point out um, that a few businesses have asked this. Um, now, you are not required to use the green and gold. We've had another a number of businesses that, 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 that say, you know, if I add another colour to my packaging, that adds more cost. Um, so all that is required um, is that your labels are legible and prominent so that they contrast against the background. Um, so you don't have to have it in green and gold. It doesn't have to be a particular font. You just have to be able to read it and be able to distinguish the information. So the three-part kangaroo label. Now this label is mandatory for priority foods that are made, grown, or produced in Australia. And we're gonna go through what these terms mean. Um, so once again, logo, bar chart, explanatory text. Mandatory for priority foods grown, produced, or made in Australia. Now the two-part only label. Now this is mandatory for most priority foods that are packed in Australia. Um, it can also be used on imported foods to show that they contain Australian ingredients. Um, but in that instance, it's done voluntarily, whereas for priority foods packed in Australia, it's mandatory for most foods. Um, now, once again, no kangaroo label for, no kangaroo logo for this label. So this isn't meant to be terrifying, this slide. Um, these are just some examples of how the mandatory text can vary. Um, so it is worth having a think about, obviously you, you're pretty um, constrained on what claim you're gonna be able to make about your food. And when we're talking about claim, we're talking about things like grown in, product are made in. Um, but then the rest of your text might vary. Um, so for example, you can call out processing that's happened overseas or um, where something's packed or um, the origin of certain ingredients for just some examples of how the labels can vary. Okay, so now we're going to go into the, the parts of the label and kind of break down the requirements for each of the parts. So we'll start off with the bar chart. Um, and the bar chart seems like a really simple thing, but we often see people getting it wrong, so it is worth spending some time making sure it's right. Um, I guess the first and foremost thing to think about is um, the Australian content claim that you're claiming about your product is a minimum percentage. So just keep that really clear in your mind at all times. So you can actually, you can have more Australian content in your product than you state, but you cannot have less than you state. So for example, if you've got um, at least 80% Australian ingredients, you could have 85%, you could have 88%, but you can't have 78 or 79%. Um, Yep, so because it's a minimum claim, you've always got to round your percentages down as well. So for example, going back to the 80, if you had 80.5%, you've got to say 80%. Um, always using whole numbers, so we're not doing decimal points or what have you. Um, you use a specific percentage in the text statement. So in the text statement, you can say 87%, 69%, 22%. Um, but in the bar chart, you showed it. You shade it to the closest ten percent increment. And again, you're going. You're shading down. You're rounding down. So if you have seventy six percent Australian content, you're shading your bar chart to seventy percent. Um, worth noting, although the bar chart's shaded in ten percent increments, it's marked in twenty percent. Um, it's just an interesting feature of it. Um, so in most cases, yeah, you'll round down to the closest 10% and shade to that. Um, there's two exceptions to that. There's always some exceptions. Um, so if you've got 95% or more Australian content in your product, you can shade the bar chart to 95%. Um, if you've got less than 10% Australian content in your product, you can shade the bar, you shade the bar chart to 5%. It's actually worth having a look at the standard itself, which you can just do by Googling the name because they've got um, like an example of how it should be shaded for almost every percentage. So it's well worth having a look at that if you're not, not too clear on it. Um, I'll just also note quickly, um, I forgot to mention, 
we will have time for questions at the end, but I'm also happy to take questions as we go, especially if you have a question that's like, I fundamentally do not understand this. I will not understand anything else unless we go over this. Um, just put your hand up and happy to go through it. Here we go. Sorry. Is this a new way of uh, so the question that we had is, is this the new labelling or is this the old labelling? This is the new labelling that you'll have to have by the 1st of July. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Um, did the, the logo with the kangaroo in it, do you have to have that triangle? Can, we, can, can you take out the kangaroo? Uh, so the question was, do you have to have the kangaroo in the triangle? Yeah. And the answer is yes. But it can be black and white. But it can be black and white. It can be... Uh, black and grey, we've, we've seen lots of variations, as long as you can distinguish it, um, you, that's, that's fine, that's what's required. And if you're worried about replicating the logo or how to do it, there is a style guide online, which you can oh, no, do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and one thing we will talk about is um, there is a resource online, also it's called the Cool Tool, um, so that's what, one way that you can get the image and you might be able to, um, you know, change change the colouring by um, adjusting the PDF or the image. Um, you might be able to do some work. Um, Emma and I have some great skills with paint, um, so it's amazing the labels that you can make in there. Um, so the third and final format that your label can be in um, is the text statement. Now, this will be very familiar to people because this is essentially what is required now. You have a text statement. Um, now, the text statement is used um, for two types of food. So your non-priority food. So if you have a non-priority food, your what you're required to do doesn't really change. Um, you used to have to do a text statement, and now you'll have to do a text statement. Um, if you're um, if you have an imported packaged priority food, um, then you will have a text statement, and that text statement has to be in a box. Um, so literally, just yeah. Just yeah. yeah, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. No, that's that's okay. Um, so yeah, that is that's the only difference between. Them. Do you look? You look like you got a question. You good? Okay. Oh yeah, and there's no silly questions. No. <laughs> We've probably been asked everything you can think of. <laughs> okay, so. Who has, so we get this question a lot, so who has to comply with the standard, who has to label? And I guess what's really important to note first off is that the labelling requirements are for certain foods, not certain people. So what I mean by that is the standard says these foods have to be labelled, it doesn't say these people have to label them. Um, a good starting point that we always recommend is if you had to label under the food code, so if you had to do origin labelling previously, you're going to have to do it under this new system. A good starting point. Um, yeah, it's probably the best way to start. Um, so it must have country of origin labeling if it's in a package. Um, if your food's in a package, the label needs to be on the package itself. Um, and that's the case if it's being sold at wholesale or retail sale. Um, so some unpackaged seafoods, meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and fungi fungi for retail sale. Um, so that can have that has the origin labeling displayed in association with it, which basically means close to it. Um, so you can have a shelf talker or a sticker on the crate, or it's not specified exactly how you do that, but you've just got to have it close by. Um, and then the third category that needs a label is fresh fruit or vegetables in transparent packaging. Again, when it's being sold in a retail sale. Um, now for that, you can either have the label on the transparent packaging itself or like for unpackaged um, seafood, meat, fruit, etc. you can have it close by. Um, worth <coughs> noting that even if the packaged food um, you sell isn't suitable for retail sale without processing pack extra processing packaging and labelling, um, you won't have to necessarily label it yourself, but the person who buys it from you can request the origin information from you and you will have to give it to them so that they can do the labels themselves. We have a question at the back. Um, so I have a couple of questions about coffee beans. Mm -hmm. But do roasted coffee beans other than those grown in Australia come under the category of uh, produced in Australia from 0% Australian degree? 
and we really need to call them the use of free feedback. Okay, so uh, two questions there about coffee beans. So if you import coffee beans, uh, can you use the label uh, produced in Australia from 0% Australian ingredients? And do you also have to use the free part kangaroo label? Um, so the first question, the answer is no. Um, so to make a produced in Australia claim, um, if, if you're talking about using the if you're talking about using the picture labels, um, so using the kangaroo label, your product has to be 100% Australian to make that claim. Um, so the coffee beans are imported. Um, they, they wouldn't be able to be counted as Australian ingredients. Um, so they would have to make a different claim. Um, and we will get into coffee beans, interestingly, later. Um, and the second part is uh, coffee is actually classed as a non-priority food. Um, so it isn't required to use the kangaroo label um, it uses the um, the text statement yes that's a minimum um, businesses can choose to use the other labels um, if they want to show that their Australian grown coffee beans are um, grown in Australia um, with the kangaroo label um, but it's not it's, it's not mandatory oh. so now we've said the standard doesn't say who is responsible, and it doesn't. But in this slide, what we've tried to do is kind of tease out what you might need to do if you're in one of these roles. Um, so if you're a grower and you're so say you grow, I don't know, tomatoes, and you sell them directly to a consumer. So for example, the example we've got here is at a local market. Then you're going to need to have the labels close by when you're selling those products. Um, if you're a manufacturer or a processor and you're the person who's actually putting the thing, the food into the package, um, it's likely you'll need to label at the point when you put it in the package. Um, if you're a retailer, then you've got to make sure that all the packaged food you're selling is labelled and that the fresh fruit and vegetables in transparent packaging or the unpackaged foods, the labels are on or near the food. Um, for importers, it's interesting to note that the food must be correctly labelled at the border or it won't be allowed into the country. So good thing to note from this is like, it's not just gonna be the retailers who are gonna be responsible. Um, it's well worth having a look through the standard and deciding whether you think you're gonna be responsible for labeling it or not. Yeah. We're a manufacturer of baked goods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we make things like a pasty, for example, mm -hmm. which contains potato, pumpkin, onion, meat. Mm -hmm. When we get our raw goods in, if we're going to then package them and sell them, we need to know where each of those components comes from to be able to make up our bar. Mm -hmm. So, in some circumstances, I um, uh, can't think, but, oh, okay, our asparagus comes sometimes from Australia, but from, sometimes from overseas. How do we overcome that when we've had our labels made? Yep. Um, and it, it may or may not be those exact same things. Or, for example, our dried fruit when we put it in our cakes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can source Australian product, but sometimes it has to come from overseas. Yep. So uh, the question was essentially about if you have a product that has a varying percentage of Australian yes. content. Um, so there's a few options there, um, and I guess it's up to businesses to determine which one works for them best. Um, so firstly, uh, like Emma said, um, the claim that you're making is a minimum proportion claim. So we have heard from businesses who, to account for this, have worked out the point of um, the point below which their product never falls. Um, so they know for certain this product will never have less than 60% Australian ingredients, so I'm going to use that on my label. Now, that comes with a few inherent problems because you need to know for certain um, that you will never drop below that point um, and you would have to keep monitoring um, because if your product did drop below, then you, you have breached the standard and potentially the Australian consumer law as well. So that's one option. Um, Another option is to have um, alternative label supplies, which we know isn't necessarily always possible for businesses. And the third option that is possible under the standard 
is to have what they call a varying um, percentage label. Um, so most of the labels that you will see will say um, from at least X percent Australian ingredients. Um, there is an allowance where businesses can use a claim that says, um, say, made in Australia, um, ingredient sources vary. Um, and then it will be a method average, by which they can um, contact you. And then it will say, like, ingredient sources vary, average 62% Australian ingredients. Um, and then it will be uh, some method that the person has to be able to, if they do something or contact a number, they can find out the percentage of Australian ingredients in that product. Now, to do that, you need to have known um, the proportion of Australian content over a period um, so that you can work out what your average is, and Emma is going to run through that later. Um, and you also have to have a mechanism where businesses can, where the customer can find out more. Um, so it has to be either a phone number, a website, or an app where if they look up the details, they can find out, well, this product says it has an average of 62% Australian ingredients, but this batch has 34. Um, so those are the options available under the standard. Probably worth noting that if you, if you have to do new labels, um, I question that we get asked quite a lot of, what if there's, I don't know, um, some sort of natural disaster and we can't source those ingredients anymore. It's always good to consider practical options and there's no issue with using practical options. So if you wanted to do something like re-sticker over your label, that would be fine as long as that sticker's, there's no risk of that sticker kind of falling off or getting peeled off easily. Um, so things like that are fine as well. Just a question. I'm in the bottom section. You're an importer, yeah. Okay. Made them correctly at the border or it won't be allowed into the country. Italians won't. Do I have to wait in Italy before it comes here? Yeah. So uh, that was a question about in an imported beverage, um, and uh, the uh, manufacturer of it doesn't want to put the Australian label on. Um, so, you know, will it be allowed into the country? Um, so all that will be required of that imported food is a statement, um, say, made in Italy or a product of Italy. Um, that's currently what they're required to do. Um, so uh, provided they keep doing that, um, you shouldn't have any issues. Uh, is it a new... Did you say it was an energy drink? Yeah. Yeah. So, like yeah. yeah. yeah, so uh, we'll get into the seven non-priority food categories, but one of those includes uh, sports drinks, um, in which case it would be uh, an imported non-priority food. So it doesn't mean... Okay. So no more. Okay. Um. So we'll get into exempt foods. So now that we've run you through when the food has to be labelled and what kind of labels you might need to do, um, we're now right at the end going to tell you what foods don't have to be labelled. Um. So the standard doesn't apply to certain foods. Um. Now this includes food for export. Um. So if you're purely exporting, those products don't have to be labelled. Um. The sort of caveat to that is um, you'll have to check what the importing country regulations are, um, just to make sure you're satisfying your obligations there. Um, if it's otherwise unpackaged, so the standard, um, if your food is unpackaged, um, the standard only applies to a very specific list of unpackaged food. Um, it's a somewhat weird and wonderful list. Um, so you've got mutton and hobbit. Um, and ham, um, fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds, um, seafood, seafood. Um, then it will have to be labelled. Um, but if you've got unpackaged cheese or unpackaged bread, um, those are products that don't have to be labelled. Um, so if you're um, a bakery and you um, uh, offer your food unpackaged just on on the shelves, that food doesn't require a pack, uh, doesn't require a label unless you prepackage it. Um, now, the standard also doesn't apply to food that is sold for immediate consumption by restaurants, um, schools, caterers, self-catering institutions. Um, so if you're a cafe, um, you bring out a plate, you put it in front of the customer. It doesn't have to have a label. You don't need to have labels on your menu. Um, you can choose to if you want to, um, but that's not required. Um, food sold at fundraising events. Um, one of the... Uh, a few important ones, um, if you're making and packaging food on the same premises where you're going to sell it, 
Um, so we use the example, uh, let's say you make cheese in your factory, you have a shop front out the front, um, you do not have to label that cheese because it, it, if you've made it and packaged it on the same site, um, but let's say you supply it wholesale to some supermarkets and they sell it. Um, once it leaves your premises, it will have to be labeled. Um, but if you're selling it on the site where you make and package it, then the standard doesn't apply. Now, uh, delivered, packaged and ready for consumption as ordered for the consumer. We're talking takeaway pizza. Um, that doesn't have to be labeled. Um, a few special ones, um, food for special medical purposes, and that has a specific definition. Um, don't ask me about it now, um, but we can point you in the right direction. Um, and also pet food. Um, your pet food, you do not get origin information about it. Yes. Can I just clarify? Um, with the, we have a cafe, mm -hmm. um, then we often have people ask us for things that we sell on our dishes to be sold in a bulk container to, you know, off they go and take home and eat it. Um, is that something that we would need to consider? So, for example, we have problems on our menu. Um, people often want to buy a container of that to take home. Is that something that we would need to consider labelling? Or is that something that we could just pop in some containers and let them take it off? Yep. Um, so I'll just repeat the question. So um, it's a question about a cafe that um, has customers that request that the food um, is packaged so they can take it home and eat it. Yeah, well, not necessarily, yeah, but it's more an item that we would sell on the menu, yeah, okay. but not necessarily the whole thing. So there might be like something on a dish that they like, and they would want to buy a container of that particular thing. Yeah. Okay. So it yes. might be a pickled onion or a sauce yeah. or a, yeah. you know, or a dip or something. Yeah. They want to buy a container just as a dip, not of the whole yeah. takeaway dish, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess the first thing to think of there, so if it's something that you've made and you've packaged on the premises, then you don't need to label it. So, for example, if you've made the hummus um, on your like in the cafe and then you package it there, you don't need to label it. Um, if it's something you buy in from somewhere else and you and you're putting it in a package, then I would say that package probably needs to be labelled. Okay. Is this something that you're making yeah. yourselves? Yeah. Yeah. Everything yeah. we make is on site ourselves. So obviously, we buy in the GP. Yeah. We buy everything, yeah. but we're making it all ourselves on the farm. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not brown chickpeas, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do often, you know, have people ask, yeah. can I buy a container of your onions or buy a container of this? And we're never really sure. So if you make it, and we'll go into, there's a specific de definition for made in. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through that in a moment. Okay. But if, yeah, if you satisfy that definition and you've made it and packaged it in the cafe, then no, you won't need to leave. Yep. Um, now I will just note, um, is anybody here, so we've had people who are in the food service industry, do we have anybody who supplies to the food service industry? No, we might have someone, yep, and we might have some at home. Um, so if you are supplying packaged food to the food service industry, um, if that food is suitable for retail sale without further processing, packaging or labelling, it has to be labelled according to the standards. That. Okay. Now, uh, sort of a practical consideration um, that is very important for businesses as we get to the end of the transition period. Um, do I have to relabel my product? Um, now, if your product is labeled according to the food codes, um, the food codes country of origin requirements, um, those products can see out their shelf life as long as the label was attached um, on or before the 30th of June 2018. Um, so the two examples we use, um, firstly is like a tin of soup. Um, so you have a tin of soup, you put the label around the packaging. Um, so the, that paper label can't, with the old country of origin requirements, um, that label can't be added to the tin, um, on or after the 1st of July, 2018, um, unless it has the new labels on it. Uh, similarly, if you have a box of cereal, um, the country of origin label would be part of the box. So you can't put food into that box um, on or after the 1st of July unless you have um, printed up new boxes or perhaps got um, label stickers to cover up the, um, the old country of origin information. So, so the key thing is you can't use old labels from the 1st of July, um, but if your food's packaged before then, you can see out your shelf life. Okay, now 
we've mentioned priority and non-priority foods a few times. It's probably not very helpful to go through what they are. <laughs> um, so basically there's seven categories of non-priority foods which are listed there. Um, basically, if your food doesn't fall under one of those categories, it's a priority food. Um, it's worth noting that in the standard itself, which again, you can just Google and you'll be able to find the whole thing, um, there is a dictionary at the back and it's really helpful to go through that because some of the things that, some of these categories are perhaps broader or narrower than you might think they are. So there's things that are, you might think are included that won't be. Um, an example off the top of my head, so um, the standard categorizes ice cream as confectionery. Um, so there's a few quirks like that. So if you're not 100% sure, have a look in the dictionary to the standard um, and that should give you some guidance on whether you've got a uh, priority or non-priority food on your hands. Yep, we have a question. Um, we make a lot of biscuits and crackers products, lavash, which are retailed. So do they need to be labelled? Biscuits, so bis they, everything needs to be labelled. Yeah. Um, but they just don't have to have the, the three part and the two part mark. Yeah. Yeah. So non priority foods, we're talking about you will have to have um, at a minimum the text statement. Yeah. Um, but you but the new picture labels aren't mandatory. Okay. Um, so biscuits, um, obviously biscuits are a non priority food. Um, whether the crackers fits within the definition of snack foods, which I'm we don't have the standard in front of us, right? Oh, Emma has this again. <laughs> 99% certain, but I don't like to commit to these sort of things. So, snack foods, so this is what's included under this definition. Um, so you've got chips, crackers, rice cakes, biscuits, cookies, crackers again, pretzels, cones, or wafers. Um, and then you've got ready to eat savory snacks, such as potato or other vegetable crisps, sticks or straws, bacon or pork crackling or prawn chips. Um, but it doesn't include cakes, muesli bars, or processed nuts. And that includes toasted nuts <laughs> and mixtures. So you crackers are on there twice. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. fairly safe to say they're a non-priority fruit. Right. <laughs> Okay, so as we said at the start, so the first thing you've got to do is decide if it's priority or non-priority, and then you've got to decide which origin claim is going to be appropriate for your product. So the first one, which is probably the most self-explanatory, um, is a groaning claim, so grown in Australia, for example. Um, so you can use this. If you've got a food with one ingredient, if it was grown there or it came from something that grown there, that's grown mm -hmm. there, yes. Um, so that could be like eggs, eggs or um, yeah. So eggs, carrots, um, chickpeas, chickpeas, milk, anything like that. It's very self-explanatory. If you've got foods with more than one ingredient and you want to say they're Australian grown. Um, it's an interesting one because the definition itself says all the significant ingredients must have grown in that country and all the processing or virtually all of the processing must have occurred there. Now that's your baseline requirement. If you want to do a grown in Australia um, claim and use the three part label, there's a slightly higher threshold. So to use the grown in Australia label and claim, you have to have 100% Australian ingredients. Uh, and not 99.9, not 99.5, it has to be 100% Australian ingredients. Yeah, so the the definition um, above the box, food for food with more than one ingredient, um, this will apply to uh, imported food. Um, it will also apply to non-priority food. Um, but if you have a food that is a priority item or you want to use the picture label, um, then your product has to be 100% to make a make a grown industry of claim. Okay, so <coughs> foods produced in a country, um, so it's very similar to the groaning definition. Um, it's slightly wider, so each of its significant ingredients was grown or wholly obtained in that country. So that means you can start including things like salt, for example, which you can't really say grow somewhere, but you can say it's produced there. Um, and all or virtually all of the processing occurred in that country. Now, 
Same story, so for imported foods and non-priority foods. Um, you're talking significant ingredients. Um, and yeah, so if you have 99% or whatever for an imported food or non-priority food, you can say it's grown in another country, for example. Um, but again, to use the Product of Australia um, label, which is going to be mandatory for priority foods, um, to use that, you need to have 100% Australian ingredients. So you're going to have to have your bar chart traded to 100% as well. Okay. Sounds good. Um, now, the third claim is uh, a claim that a food was made in a country. Now, this is obviously going to be important for a lot of businesses, um, particularly those who had, you know, maybe 99 or 98% Australian ingredients and can no longer make a product of Australia claim. Um, those products, we'll be looking to see whether they fall under the definition of made in. Um, now, to say that a food was made in a country, um, you have to be able to show that it underwent its last substantial transformation in the country claimed. Um, now, substantial transformation um, is you have to look to another piece of legislation for the definition. Um, but essentially, a food is substantially transformed in a country if it was grown or produced in that country. So that just basically means if you can say that you grew something or you produced it, you can also claim that it was made in Australia. Um, now, if your food contains imported ingredients, uh, you will need to show that processing in the country named has created a product that is fundamentally different in identity, nature, or essential character from all of the imported ingredients that went into it. Now, before we get more into made in, um, so just quickly, um, if your food cannot claim to have been grown, produced, or made in a single country, um, you will be likely making a packed in Australia claim. Um, so the example we like to use is nuts. Um, let's say you have American almonds and Australian cashews. Um, you bring them together, you mix, and you pack them in Australia. Um, now, the nuts have been grown um, in more than one country, um, the nuts that are in this package, um, and they haven't been substantially transformed in Australia. So putting nuts in, in a sealer bag is not going to satisfy the test. Um, so in this instance, those nuts could only be labelled as packed in Australia um, because you can't claim that they were grown in America or Australia. We have a question. Um, what about if you then dip those nuts in coffee and transform them? Yeah, so we had a question that kind of came in like this. Um, so essentially, like, what if you import a nut and then you, um, I, I think the industry likes to use the word enrobe. Um, so you enrobe it in some coffee and then some chocolate. Um, so the question is going to be, have you moved from a nut to confectionery? Um, we've looked at a few different examples, um, not necessarily that one in particular, um, but we have looked at other ones where you'll say um, coating a sultana in chocolate um, and we've said you know you're likely to that that product is now a non-priority food um, because the definition of confectionery includes um, cocoa and chocolate products um, so without having looked at that specific example um, we would say that if it's got chocolate um, you're probably leaning towards a non-priority confectionery category Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, just we weren't sure that was going to work. <laughs> we'll distribute goods for sale in Australia. Will you claim your products are made in a particular country? If so, you need to consider your obligations under the Australian consumer law. By saying that you made something, you are making a claim about the manufacturing process which your customers may rely on. It is your responsibility to ensure the claim is truthful, clear, and accurate. Before you say your products are made in a particular country, you should ask yourself whether they were substantially transformed in that country. But what does that mean exactly? Well, a good is substantially transformed if it was grown or produced in that country, or processing in that country has created a product that is fundamentally different in identity, nature, or essential character from its imported ingredients or components. 
Take, for example, a T-shirt. If you import fabric and cut and sew it into a T-shirt, then you have substantially transformed the fabric into a different product. But it's not substantial transformation if you only add a logo to an imported T-shirt. The same thing applies if you only paint a chair or put eyelets on a shoe. Processes like this, which only serve to finish off the product, will not result in a fundamentally different product. How about food? If you use imported ingredients to make an apple pie, you will have created something fundamentally different from the imported ingredients you started with. But processes that only change the form or appearance of an imported food, like grating cheese, crumbed fish, or adding water to an orange concentrate to make juice, will not be a substantial transformation of those imported ingredients. You should think twice about saying your product is made in a country unless processing in that country has clearly resulted in a fundamentally different product. You can face penalties if you make a false or misleading claim about where you made your product. For more information about country of origin claims, visit the ACCC website. Okay, there you go. That video has never worked in any other presentation. Um, that was quite surprising. <laughs> Too far. Okay, so the meaning of substantial transformation. Um, so, not to rehash what the video just artfully explained, um, but basically, if it's something grown or produced in that country, you can make a mating claim. If your food has imported ingredients, you're looking for processing that will result in a fundamentally different product in either identity, nature, or essential character. Um, when compared to all of the imported ingredients. Um, so the example we have on the screen um, is biscuits. So if you take um, Australian ingredients and you add imported cocoa and you make a biscuit, obviously a biscuit is fundamentally different to cocoa. Um, so these are the types of um, comparisons that I guess businesses have to start sort of thinking of. Um, so in terms of some practical examples, um, so the HCC has put together a list of instances where we think a substantial transformation has or hasn't occurred. Um, I like to reiterate that it's our opinion. It's there to help businesses and give a bit of a guide, um, but it can be controversial um, because for as many people who agree with one, there's just as many people who disagree. Um, so. Just to go through a few of them, um, so going back to the coffee bean, um, so roasting a coffee bean, um, so why we've said this is a substantial transformation is um, a green coffee bean doesn't have the taste, doesn't have the aroma, you can't grind it up and put it in your coffee and the cheese, um, the same effect. Um, it it's apparently will help you lose weight, um, but it might not give you that kick that you want in the morning. Um, so that's why we say, you know, the when you roast that bean, you have changed its identity, its nature, or its essential character. And it isn't or, you just have to satisfy one of those things. Um, but we would say, if you say roast an imported cashew, um, you have a cashew and you have a roasted cashew. Um, I've had people argue very strongly that by changing the fat um, percentage of the nut, you have fundamentally changed it. Um, but I politely disagreed and reiterated that we would say if you just roast an imported nut, that is not a fundamental, um, a fundamentally different product. Um, some other ones, uh, if you mix imported ingredients to bake a cake, um, if you cure and dry imported pork to make bacon, you've got raw pork, end product is bacon. Um, by contrast, if you add a marinade to imported chicken, um, you have a, a chicken meat and then you might have um, I know chicken meat, flavored chicken meat. Um, so these are the kind of comparisons that you sort of have to do. Um, last one, we're talking like gro roasting, roasting, grinding, and blending spices to make a curry paste. Um, we would say would likely be a substantial transformation. Um, but if you're blending, um, say raw rice and spices to make um, a flavored rice mix, um, we would say in that instance, it's unlikely to be a substantial transformation. Um, and for any businesses who might be doing um, what we call a blending or dry blending in general, um, if you have primarily imported ingredients that you're just blending together, um, it is going to be difficult to satisfy the test and you're really going to have to look at um, 
the product that, that you have and how it differs from what you have, have imported um, because it, it, it might be harder to satisfy that test if you're, um, if you're blending dry ingredients. I guess one thing to note there is if you're looking for a more extensive, we haven't done an exhaustive list, it would be an impossible task, but if you're looking for a more extensive list of what we think will and won't constitute substantial transformation, there's one in our food labeling guide, which is available on the website. So it's worth having a look at. Yeah. So tips when you're making a mating claim. Um, so the legislation doesn't define what identity, nature, and essential character mean. Um, to work those out, you're gonna have to look at um, the dictionary. Um, that's just how the law works. So identity, we're talking about things like the condition, character, or distinguishing features of a thing. Um, nature, um, the particular combination of qualities that belong to something by birth or constitution, so it's native or inherent character. Um, and then essential character, um, we're talking the necessary or indispensable qualities that distinguish one thing from others. Um, so they're all very much of a theme. Um, but it is a significant change um, from the previous test, um, which talked about um, change to form and appearance. Um, so if you previously made a mating claim, um, you will need to look at your product and reevaluate and just check whether you still satisfy the new test to make a mating claim. Um, because if, uh, if your product was previously just a change to form or appearance, how something looked, um, then you will not satisfy the new test and you'll have to look at an alternative claim likely packed in. Uh, so one thing that we say is don't focus too much on the process. Um, so we have a lot of businesses that come in and say, I do this, or I do, um, I do something else. And um, as we sort of saw with like the roasting the nut, roasting the bean example, in both instances, you're talking roasting, but the end result is different depending on the actual product. Um, so you actually have to look at the product that you're dealing with rather than looking at the category of processing overall. Um, once again, the processing has to result in a fundamental change for all of the imported ingredients. Um, so we've uh, seen instances of businesses where um, they have changed fundamentally some ingredients, but, there are, but you have to change all of them. Um, so if you haven't changed all of the if you haven't resulted in a product that's fundamentally different from all of the imported ingredients, then you won't satisfy the test. It has to be different from all of the imported ingredients. Um, and like I said, uh, form or appearance um, changes will not satisfy the test. Okay, bit of a maths lesson. That's what everyone wants at 6.30 at night. Um, okay, so we're going to talk now about how you calculate the proportion of the Australian content in your product. So. Where you're going to need to display that is in your bar chart and in your explanatory text. Um, so um, there is a specified formula in the standard, which does make it nice and easy. A um, couple of things to consider before you start. Um, so obviously we're trying to work out the minimum content of Australian ingredients. To say something is Australian ingredient, it needs to have been grown or produced here. Um, Another key thing to think about is it the calculation is based on the ingoing weight of the ingredients. So easy way to say that is it's your recipe and not what you take out of your oven at the end. Um, and yeah, just keep it, um, really keep in mind that you're doing the minimum content. Okay. Cool. So this is the formula. Um, so total weight, total ingoing weight of ingredients. So you figure out the weight of everything going into your food. Um, and then you figure out the um, total weight of all the ingredients that are, are grown or produced here and you divide the amount, the, in, the weight of the ingredients that are grown or produced in Australia by the total amount. It's a pretty simple sum, it's just a bit of background working out the weight of all your ingredients and the weight of your Australian ingredients. Seems really obvious, but please don't guess the percentage of Australian ingredients in your product. Please do the calculation. Um, okay, so we have got um, a couple of relatively simple examples here. So this one um, is a cake made from Australian butter, sugar, eggs, hazelnut meal, and um, imported chocolate, vanilla extract, and cocoa powder. Um, so what we've done is we've added up the um, amounts in the left-hand column, the Australian ingredients column. 
that's coming at 840 grams. And then we're adding everything in both the columns, so all of the ingredients together, and that's coming out as 1,007 grams. Um, we're then, so we're dividing them, we're times it by 100, and that will come out as 83 point something, something, something. Um, so you've got a minimum percentage of 83% Australian content in your cake. So this is what your label would then look like. So you've got logo, bar chart shaded to 80%, and then 83% stated in your explanatory text. Um, now we touched on this earlier. So, oh, I'll stop. Got a question? Sorry, just to take us back a little bit. Someone just asked, so roasted coffee from 100% imported bean could be labelled as made in Australia from imported ingredients under the kangaroo three tier system. That is correct. Um, so if you uh, import coffee beans um, into Australia, uh, you could either make a claim based on where the beans were actually grown, um, so you could say uh, grown in Kenya, um, or because they have been substantially transformed in Australia, you could make, uh, you could use the three-part label and say um, made in Australia from imported ingredients, and you would have an unshaded bar chart to show that the product contains no Australian ingredients. So we touched on this earlier. So um, another thing you can do is you can do an average minimum content claim. Um, so where this might be useful is if you, some of your ingredients are only available seasonally, for example, um, and you just want to do one label. You don't want to have to redo the label every month or whatever because I understand that could be quite challenging. Um, so you need to work these average claims out. You can choose to do it based over a 12, 24 or 36 month period, so basically one, two or three years. Um, that Those don't have to be calendar or financial years, it's just the block of time. It seems really obvious, but I'm sure we have been asked that before. We have, we have. Um, now we've done an example here, and to keep it relatively simple for us, we're saying we're making one batch of this product a month. Um, so to get the numbers in the, percentage, in the percentage row, what we've done there is we've done the calculation that we've done on the previous slide. So we've worked out the minimum content, the minimum Australian content in the product. So in month one, you've got 83% Australian content. In month six, you've got 65%. So you work it out for your 12, your 24, or your 36 month period. Um, and then you divide it by 12, um, and that will spit out your average content claim. Um, so again, relatively easy sum, but you just need to make sure you have all the information in the background. Yes. It's only four months until it becomes mandatory, so we don't have enough time to do all of that. So you have to run past, or yes. So um, you do your 12, 24, and 36 months based on past. Yeah, yeah. Um, how often would you have to update that then? Yep, yep. Um, so if you use an average content claim, uh, that label is good for two, two years. years. Yep. Two years from when you did the calculation. So you would be able to use that label for two years. Um, at the end of that period, you would have to recalculate and adjust your labeling as required um, based on the information that you um, that you, uh, I guess, kept during that period. So that's another thing that's worth noting is that when you're doing an average content claim, that doesn't mean that you sort of go, all done, don't need to worry about that for 12, 24, 36 month period. Um, you still need to be keeping your calculations um, for two purposes. So a customer who wants to find out about the actual content in their batch can actually find that out. Um, and you will also need it when you recalculate your average. So is this the point where you then have that further information for the yeah, yes. and I've just realised this label is wrong. Um, so don't do, this is an example of what not to do. Um, yeah. So what you'd have, so I think it's got cut off, but there you would yes. have um, phone number for details, um, scan yes. this, just go yeah. to this website. Um, oh, actually, we go back. if we go back, oh, phew, sorry. Guys. I think it was on the... Yeah, no, it was... Yeah, yeah so that, oh, just above the orange box, so that's what it should look like for a packed in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can have, if it was grown and made and produced, it would have the logo as well. Um, but yeah, you, you need, the final section is 
scan barcode for details or call this number for details or visit this website for visit details. Website, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and the last thing we'll just note there as well is you also, when doing the calculation, you have to look at um, whether you have to count something as an ingredient or not. Um, so processing aids do not, uh, they are not counted towards the calculation, but additives are. Um, so that's just handy. Oh, One more question. So all those calculations, do we then need to keep a record of all those calculations um, and how long do we need to keep them for? Yes, uh, so you do need to uh, keep that information, um, particularly so under the standard, there is a power for agencies such as the ACCC to contact a business and require you to substantiate the claim that you're making. Um, so you will have to do it. I'll have to check how long you have to keep it for. Um, but you should keep it um, as general good business practice, yeah. um, but also to be able to substantiate it if anyone comes knocking. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you're looking at keeping it for a year, I believe. Um, so that is after was, the product is sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a record keeping obligation. Um, so just check that one up. Okay, um, so last sort of bit before we get into um, a bit more interesting stuff consequences of non compliance. Um, so failure to comply with the standard uh, does expose a business to enforcement action by the ACCC or a state and territory regulator. Um, so the maximum penalty that can be enforced by a court is $1.1 million for a corporation um, and $220,000 for an individual. Um, the court can also make other orders such as compensation, um, corrective advertising or injunctions requiring you to do something or stop doing something. Um, so there is under the Australian Consumer Law, there's a right of private action. Um, so businesses, um, so uh, affected uh, consumers or businesses can also take action um, if they believe that they've suffered damage um, because of the business's non-compliance. Um, now, a, a lot of people sort of ask us, like, how will you know that my label is incorrect? Um, now, the ACCC will be doing market surveillance activities. Um, so we'll be actively checking labels. Um, and interestingly, um, the a lot of the information we receive about business misconduct is from competitors of the businesses. Um, so they are the people who in the industry um, have a pretty good idea about supply arrangements and what kind of claims you can and can't be making. Um, so just something to be aware of. Um, so these penalties will be available so it's really important that businesses take the time to get their labels right and make sure that they're ready to go for the 1st of July. Okay, false and misleading representations. So images on your product that might suggest it's from a particular country. We've got some pretty obvious examples here. Um, so these are things that give might give the consumer an impression that your product is from a certain place. Um, if you're giving a consumer an impression that your product is from a certain place, it needs to be from that place, otherwise that's going to be false and misleading. Um, so it's not just the information that you've got in your country of origin label, it can be words, images, representation, anything else you've got on your package. Um, so just be really careful with those because if they're not um, truthful and accurate representation of where your product is actually from, um, you could risk breaching the Australian consumer law. Um, one other thing I might note here though is Obviously, you've got to include the country of origin information as set out in the standard. But if you wanted to make other representations elsewhere on your product, for example, about your company being Australian owned or being from a certain region, there's nothing to prevent you from doing that. Again, it's got to be truthful and accurate, but you can do that just not within the country of origin label, but you can do that elsewhere on your product. So we've heard from a lot of businesses that want to call out, you know, that they're um... Uh, you know, grown in the Barossa Valley, um, that there's these, uh, what we would call place of origin claims. Um, so they're claims that can, um, I guess, carry weight with consumers. 
um, that's fine to use. Like Emma said, it just has to be truthful and accurate. Okay. So some quick tips and traps. Okay. Yeah. So these are the key things that we want everyone to remember. Just another question. I'm sorry. So does this apply for case that is sold individually? I'm guessing that's. So the question is, does this apply for cakes that's sold individually? I'm guessing that means the labelling requirements as a whole. Yeah. There's a few different things there. So I think I heard someone say, depends if it's packaged. Yeah. And gold, gold star. Gold star, because that's exactly right. So if you're selling a cake that's packaged, then it will need to have a country of origin label on the package. Unpackaged cake does not need to be labelled. Um, having said that, if you're a bakery and you make and you package that cake on your premises, it doesn't need to be labelled. Um, okay, so we'll run through, yeah, so if these are the only things to take away from today, these are the really important things. So basically, if you have to label under the old food code, you need to label under the new standard and you need to make sure you're getting your labels ready now. Um, relatedly, you need to transition to the new <coughs> products by the 1st of July 2018. I know we've said this over and over again, but please don't leave it too late. Um, to use a grown in Australia or produce an Australia kangaroo label, so that three part logo, and to say grown in Australia or produce in Australia, just remember that you need to have 100% Australian ingredients. Um, don't assume you're not responsible. Um, at the very least, you might need to provide information to someone else about the origin requirements of the food. Um, don't attach the old labels after 1 July. And double check if your food is priority or non-priority. As we said earlier, go and have a look at the dictionary and the standard. There's also an FAQ section on our website, which will set out some of the not priority and non-priority, so that's worth having a look at as well. And if you're really not sure, it might be better to err on the side of caution, um, just to be safe, um, if you really can't distinguish. Um, now, uh, if you're looking to make a mating claim, make sure that there's been a fundamental change to all imported ingredients. Um, remember, minor processing is not going to be sufficient to make that mating claim. Um, now, having the correct information will help you to do the correct calculation. Um, so businesses should be contacting suppliers. Um, relatedly, estimates about the percentage of Australian content is not going to be good enough. Um, you need to sit down and do the calculation. Um, now, one thing we didn't get into with ingredients was water. Um, so the origin of water is usually where it was collected. Now um, you don't, now if, if you have let's say a can of chickpeas um, and they're in a, um, in a water a solution like a brine, um, then uh, if you do that in, in Australia, um, you don't count the water that is in that liquid packing medium um, if it's not consumed. Um, so in that instance, you wouldn't be able to count the water, um, but if that water is generally consumed, um, so let's say you have a tin of peaches and it's in like a sugar water syrup, um, people do consume that. You'd be able to count that water, um, but if the water is usually tipped out and thrown away when people open the product, then you don't get to count that water towards your percentage. Uh, we also encourage businesses to seek legal advice. Um, now, for more information, um, so the ACCC website link is um, www.accc.gov.au forward slash cool. Um, that will get you to our food labelling guide, um, which is sort of our main resource. There's some new stuff that we're developing at present um, that will be helpful for businesses. Um, we also have an FAQ page. Um, that's where we deal with the weird and wonderful inquiries that we get in every day. Um, so if you're if your question isn't covered in the food labeling guide, it might be on the FAQ page, um, just because that is more suitable for those really niche specific questions. Otherwise, the food guide would be 100 pages long. Now, there is a country of origin labeling tool, the Cool Tool. It is available from business.gov.au. Um, it is a great resource, um, but what we say to people is, don't use the tool to work out what your label should be. Um, the tool is based on the spits out the label based on the information that you put in and we have seen businesses get it wrong. Um, so it's better to um, look at the standard, look at our food labelling guide, work out your label first and then you know what what you're putting in um, and your odds of getting a correct label are much higher. 
So it's really good for the design of the label and setting all the label all out correctly. Um, but it's not going to tell you if you should say grown in, produced in, made in, for example. Yeah. Um, and it also won't do the calculation for you. So you there's a blank box and you put it in and then that's what the label says. Um, our YouTube channel, we have done another webinar um, that was uh, longer than this one, if you couldn't believe. Um, <laughs> so you can watch that. Um, it's divided up into specific segments. So if you wanted to just go over calculating Australian ingredients, you could just watch that part. Um, we also have an online education program um, that we recommend for small businesses. It'll look generally at country of origin labeling, but it'll run through things like pricing, advertising, um, you know, uh, dealing with suppliers. Um, so there's a, a lot of other stuff that's relevant under the Australian consumer law. Um, you can, it's free, you can do it at your leisure. Okay, any other questions? So it's really self-regulations. In part, so businesses have to work it out themselves. Um, that That is the key thing. Um, so that's why <coughs> we have, for the past two years, had such a strong emphasis on education um, this is a big change for businesses, um, so we're doing as much as we can to sort of help businesses work out what their label should be. Other questions? So I'll start with one. Mm -hmm, Basically importing the drink from Europe. Just got to put... Country of origin text statement, that's all that's required. Um, now, if you were importing a product that had Australian ingredients. What if it's already on the can where it's from? Do I still have to put the label? Um, if, if the country of origin information is already on, on the, the can, can. Um, then, then you won't have to do it. Um, but it, let's say you have a product that you do import that has Australian ingredients. Um, so there's things like, let's say you, uh, Australian apples are sent overseas and made into a juice in Malaysia, you could say made in Malaysia text statement in a box, or you could say made in Malaysia from Australian ingredients and you would use the bar chart only label. My main, main issue is the 10 cents refund labeling for South Australia and Northern Territory. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. And do other states have that yet? New South Wales has They're just brought it in. Or mm -hmm. well, they have? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it would be SA, NT, and and ACT. I guess I might just distinguish the reason we're saying that that food is fine as this is because it's a non priority food. So, can I just write 10 cents refund available in your state of purchase? I won't give you advice on that. Yeah, so so we can't tell you that either. Um, so, put the whole lot on there. You'll have to check you with someone else. Yeah. You may need to take legal advice. I'm sorry, I just That's can't right. because we're getting into a complex area of other states' legislation mm -hmm. okay. and what they. Yes. South Australia is very well developed over a long yes. period of time. Yeah. So it's, I'd, I'd hate to give you advice. Yeah. Uh, we have, have an online question. Two questions. So the first one is Are there staff requirements for the label? Are there what, sorry? Size requirements. Are there, so that question was, are there size requirements for the labels? And I guess the simple answer to that is no, but with a caveat that they must be legible. So don't have the text so small that no one can possibly read it. The second one is looking at a display cabinet of a butcher shop, all fresh, all fresh product, all Australian growth, apart from a couple of marinades and feta in the sausage. What signage or labelling should be in the window and where? Okay, so that question is, if I've got a display cabinet and I've got mostly Australian product and then I've got a couple of um, products with potentially imported marinades or ingredients, mm -hmm. what do I do there? So one thing that we have suggested to businesses is if you have a display case, a market stall, any display area where... The, all the products in that area have the same origin. So for example, everything there is Australian grown or Australian produced. You can use one label. That, need, that label needs to be prominent, it needs to be clear, and it also needs to be really obvious what product it applies to. So what we've suggested to people that might be a good practical solution is if possible, and I know this isn't feasible in every scenario, but trying to separate out your Australian grown, Australian produced, and then you can have one label for that, Obviously, everything that relates to that label must be Australian grown or produced. And then having things which, for example, are made in, 
they'll probably will need to be labeled individually unless they've got the same percentage of Australian yeah. content, which is probably the one. So this we're sp specifically talking about unpackaged meat products, which do require a label. And uh, what the standard says is the label has to be on or near the food. So if the label has to be near the food, um, it can be satisfied if you have one label for multiple products, but it has to apply to all of them. So um, I, I think when you're talking butchers, you're talking like primal. So you have chicken breast, you have, you know, a cut of steak, you have a cut of pork, and there's no other ingredients. For those products, you could use one label, but it has to be really clear what it applies to. If you have other products like sausages or marinated meats, which have um, less than 100%, then you'll have to label those products individually. Um, and it'll have to be really clear which labels apply to which products. Yeah, and I guess I should just say as well that if something's packaged, the label has to go on the package. So even if you've got 50 of the same thing packaged, it still has to be on each package. Another question? No? I think well, that's okay, you can clarify. Oh, okay. cool. Any more questions? Yeah? Does the DR clause wine fall under the non Does wine fall under? The DR clause wine. So yeah. what wine came under your uh, non priority? Yeah, non so the alcohol definition, I think, is like products with like 0.5% alcohol volume or something. So alcoholic beverages will be a non priority food. Um, just checking if there's an So you're talking wine that's been, and the alcohol yeah. taken out? That's right. Yeah. So not grape juice, de-alcoholized. Yeah, so, de so any beverage with more than 0.5% by weight volume of alcohol, that's going to come under the definition of alcohol. Yeah. That's what alcohol sort of beverage is. Yep. Um, if you don't fall under that, you'll have to consider whether you fall under one of the other um, beverage categories. Um, but otherwise, um, it would... If, 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 it, if it doesn't fall within a non-priority category, it'll be a priority food. So we haven't specifically looked at de-alkalized um, alcohol, <laughs> unfortunately. So you're saying it has to have more than 0.5%? Yes, um, to fit within the definition of alcohol. Okay, well, if we could thank uh, Emma and Kylie for, uh, I think, a very informative presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now, I know on the webinar we had some uh, comments in relation to how does this help small business. Uh, I think I'll make a couple of comments. It, it is federal law. It's not something the state has put together. Um, but if you, if you do feel very strongly about it, you should talk to your local member. That said, I think the laws have been framed with the consumer in mind and consumer demand. And the consumers these days, are looking very much at where does what I eat come from and what's the origin of the products in it. And um, people are quite demanding in that area. So I think from a business perspective, look at the opportunity. Yes, I know there is some red tape, but you have to do it. It's been decided by the parliament federally. And I think there's ways of uh, capitalising on, on it. Now, I did note um, the discussion about Coating sultanas with chocolate. And I, and I think all the talk about food, we're all pretty hungry. The best I can offer you is some tin cans. <laughs> um, I did have a look, and I'm glad if I can even find where it was made, but I'm, there is some fine print there. Um, and it is going to be a challenge for some manufacturers to actually do that. But I'm sure, again, focusing on the consumer, with the consumer in mind and their demands in mind, there's opportunity there. Um, I'm really pleased that we nailed it with the video. Uh, oh, well, we? And well done to Brenton, uh, who's put tonight on. I think we need to give Brenton a round of applause. So that brings us to the end of proceedings. Thank you so much for attending. There's a feedback form on your chair there. Um, if you could fill that out, uh, because that helps us make sure we're delivering what you want. And if we're not, we also can then uh, adjust our offerings. Please like us on Facebook, uh, our LinkedIn site, and also YouTube, uh, where we can keep you up to date in terms of past events, and we'll have this one up there shortly. Thanks to everyone on webinar. If you have any queries or concerns, please email our office, and uh, we'll respond to that. Thanks again for attending tonight, and keeping in mind upcoming events.
1st of May, we've got our BizLink session in Mount Barker, where we bring federal, state and local government agencies together uh, to talk about exactly what they do, but it's an expo-style format, so if you've got specific questions, you can go and see uh, that particular agency. 8th of May, what you need to know about employing staff, we'll be running that out at the Polaris Centre at Mawson Lakes. And on the 22nd of May, dispute resolution for your small business. Uh, we'll go into some detail about how disputes are resolved. And that's on the uh, 22nd of May, 5.30, right here, same place, same location. Thanks again for attending and hope to see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you.